Uh, response video to a few videos. Um, there's a Wise Monkey video and a Bark Lord video. I'm not going to play either one of these um, because I think I got the point of them, sort of, if there is a point. Um, I will mention uh, the Grey Guy did make another video, Currency of Reality. Um, that was, you know, it was pretty good. Took some clips from the Do in the Morning um, video. Um, you know, some of it's good towards the end anyway. Anyway, but the one thing that's uh, kind of bizarre is this schlock of God guy who's really irritating. He did a really kind of a funny video, this little cartoon thingy. <laughs> yeah, with the hair. Face is too round to be me, but the hair just is, does seem kind of a giveaway. Um, but yeah, he's a righteous preventer, he called him. Uh, yeah, I think we'll have something in there about, I don't know, unimposing man or something. <laughs> he imposes the unim un unimposition. Um, but anyway, he has got a little prego with a line through it. It's kind of funny. A little Benatar book there to throw at people. Um, I don't know what this little thing, remote control-y thing is. Pretty good, though. Um, but anyway, it is, it is kind of funny. So, I mean, surprising, you know, source of, you know. It's, a lot of people have talent here on YouTube. It is kind of surprising. Well, it's not surprising. It's just kind of disappointing that we all kind of have nothing to do with it. <laughs> so we're stuck here on YouTube. Um, arguing shit. Uh, but anyway, yeah, just really surprising. I mean, this guy is, I really dislike this guy a lot. And, uh, this was really kind of, um, charming almost. So anyway, I'll post a link below. <clears throat> I don't know how he's going to take the story. I mean, I guess anti-natalism will choke on a chicken bone or something. Chicken soup bone. Or some kind of bullshit like that. But anyway, <clears throat> um, alright, I'll do Wise Monkey first, and then I'm gonna, I'm also gonna finish up with some guy, uh, whatever, brother or something. Theo, brother, whatever, brother, some guy. Anyway, he sort of wants me to respond, so I will. Um, alright, Wise Monkey made a video, and he just, um, you know, all this snarkiness is still in the air, and I don't see any point in all that crap, but, um, alright, so his argument is, that he needs this some sort of definitive proof that um, when we take this life game and play it out like chess or something that somehow the victory of the the king right the king wins in the end well I mean one king gets killed in the end one side wins one side loses they have this little game this competition thing and um, uh, that it's worth the the pieces left on the board that get to celebrate having some wine and cake and cheese and crackers or whatever they get. Um, it's worth all the little dead pawns and the dead knights and whatever else got wiped out in the playing of the game. So I'm metaphoring, but the point is, is the argument is, is that somehow our pleasures, no, I'm arguing, that our pleasures are trite and superficial by comparison to the hardness of the extreme sufferings that go happen. Alright, not the stub toes, the extreme shit, the hard stuff, the the long goodbye where you lose 70 pounds and your mind um, and your lunch every day. Um, yeah, just nasty shit that people have to live with. Hard, negative, unpleasant time. Hard time. So it almost like you could think of it like a prison sentence, you know, that you could you could live a life to be 70 years old, but you had to spend 10 years in, you know, the worst prison in the world, Dachau. <laughs> you had to spend 10 years in hell. Um, absolute hell. Uh, and uh, would it be worth it? And, and he says, I need some sort of conclusive proof. I'm going to argue that I don't need it. That what we do know from personal experience is that there are these really some bad things, you know, pretty bad, pretty heavy bad. And there are these good things, you know, this, you know, fun, fun, fun for everyone, cotton candy, bullshit, whatever. And, um, and all we have to know is that we have the testimony of millions of people who say, yeah, this is shit, I'm sorry I was born, I really don't like playing this idiotic game. And that their testimony alone, they're the ones getting imposed on, they're the one who, who are living a life that they're telling you by their standards isn't good enough and the, and, the, and the real question to answer is why do you have a right to impose that not good enough life on those individuals shouldn't you be able to prevent that before you do that is sort of the argument 
And that's the basic argument, the, the most fundamental for me, the crudest argument. It's just that basic argument of not imposing. And so until you can do this without imposing, without cl creating collateral damage, and that's what we could call collateral damage. I've used that word now. Let's call the people who draw the short stick um, end up with the hard life and the hard perception that their hard life is pointless and stupid, not the happy perception that I'm chasing the pink balloon and I don't care what... I don't care what happens to me because I'm going to get that pink balloon. Um, it's a lot harder, yeah, if you've got to live undriven um, or smart enough to know you're in hell. Um, there is the bliss of ignorance. That isn't a false concept. It's a real concept. It's a real reality in the world. You're, the dumber you are, the happier you're going to be. Um, because the less you'll understand, the less you'll be capable of worry or fear our guilt, our remorse, um, all these negative burdens of intelligence. Um, so how else to put this? I mean, obviously this is an equation between, um, you know, something that's real, like pain and suffering, and something that is made of desire. And those are different kinds of concepts. Desire is what screws this game up, because it isn't proportional. It breaks proportionality. It breaks the balance. So now you're no longer f capable of a fair judgment because your addiction tips the scale. And that's why rats will starve to death um, to get their heroin or to get the nicotine or to get some other chemical. Um, they will break nature um, through addiction. And that's what we can see in human psychology. So anyway, I mean, I don't think there's going to be an absolutist argument. All there can be is this obvious argument that do you have a right to impose? Do you have a right to create collateral damage? So I guess that would be the argument. If you're a warrior in battle, do you have a right to shoot the woman to get to the soldier? I mean, the civilian. Um, so that's the first question. The first issue you have to resolve is why... Why do you have a right to collect, create collateral damage? What are you rescuing? What is so important to preserve, to, to, to save here, um, that you must do it at that collateral damage price? Uh, and um, the second point is the more, the bigger picture thing, maybe, even. You know, it's not on an ethical ground, on an individual level. It's just on the whole game play which gets to Barklord's video um, where we get into the what is this thing we're playing in the first place and is it a zero-sum game and is it tic-tac-toe and is it just a mechanical DNA molecule spreading across the planet and that there's no possibility for anything but a zero-sum game it is a, a childhood game of king of the mountain the mountain is irrelevant the victory is irrelevant it's just playing the stupid game. But the game creates damage and destruction and pain and suffering. So I guess I would argue again to, um, you know, can we analyze a life like, say, um, I don't know, Snoop, Snoop Bouncy Bouncy Ball, right? Some kid is on a, a playing basketball every day, right? Because he's going to be the greatest basketball player in the world. Now, we can know that that's a, a stupid investment, that the odds of that happening are, you know, one in a million, and that all that time and energy is going to be invested, and it's going to be a complete wasted time and energy. Instead of learning how to be a citizen and to be civilized and to, be, and to have a skill, the person has wasted all their energy being this thing, to get to this thing, to get to this goal, and the goal can't be reached. I mean, the odds are against it. So it's not practical. It's not efficient. And that's the judgment we can make about this this vehicle called life. I mean, how much gas is consumed? I mean, aren't we creating more losers than winners? I mean, it seems kind of obvious that that's what we do. There's more sacrificed pieces than there are pieces left at the end of the game. Unless we can figure out some way to change that um, ratio substantially, um, why should the game be played? 
I mean, I've used the tic-tac-toe analogy that it's a, an imbecile game when looked at for what it really is. When we really look at what we're, what desires we're satisfying, they're crude, they're contrived by our biology, they don't have any real merit beyond the fact that they exist in us, and they compel us to do things. But why should that compulsion force the future? Why should it be forced into the future? Why shouldn't it just die with us? Um, it, it has no function. It can't function. It's only function, again, we're need machines. So you got to deal with that concept. And you got to deal with the concept that we create need. We don't satisfy. We satisfy a portion of our need, but we create more need than we ever can satisfy. And um, the only way we can be productive is to fix what's broken in the world around us. And the only thing that breaks the world around us is sentient being in harm's way. So the only way you can do something truly good in most circumstances is to take something out of harm's way, including yourself. And so we're only cleaning up a mess created by our own existence. I mean, that's a real concept you have to deal with. And why would you create a need that doesn't need to exist? There, you have to articulate a reason for existence because existence comes at a price. Anything that comes at a price has to justify itself. And you can't keep negating the fucking price and pretending the price doesn't exist. It exists. And you need more than, you know, I had yummy cake as a justification. All right, anyway, but to get to Bark Lord now specifically, um, I know he's still complaining about a video I made like three months ago or two months ago. And, and I, I don't even get his complaint. The video I made, I, it, it, it had a, um, um, a continuity of its own. It wasn't a direct response to him. It was an indirect response. But regardless, it doesn't even matter. The point is, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know. So, so you're saying that the answer to life's mysteries or solving or resolving our lack of function has something to do with the space in between atoms or the space in between electrons and nucleuses? What's in between that space, whether it's nothing or something? I don't see how that's going to answer the question. What the universe is doing seems clearly to be simplistic mechanical process. It's not doing something that says make intelligent creatures. That's not really the point. It's the only reason for intelligence to exist. It has to exist in an organism motivated. I mean, I have made this argument, so maybe just try to counter-argue this simple argument. The function of our intelligence from evolution all right, was only as a scheming tool. It was a scheming tool for an individual organism to get its DNA, or DNA similar to itself, into the future. Period. And it was an effective tool. Being able to manipulate the environment and club somebody to death and steal their stuff was very effective in getting us to the future. It's effective now in other organisms that have limited intelligence but have intelligence. They can scheme. They can plan. They can execute um, a strategy. And that's what we do with our intelligence. And that's why we have it. That's where we derived it from. And its function, basically, is in, in the possession of this need machine, this feeling organism, it just becomes a tool for scheming to get what that organism wants. Now, when we get smarter and smarter, we realize that, well, I'm a pawn, he's a pawn, he's a pawn, he's a pawn. It doesn't matter which one of us get fucked. All right? The only thing that matters is a pawn is going to get fucked. <laughs> and that's all that matters. And so we can do that with our intelligence. We can realize bigger issues of the game. But let's take the game. Let's, you tell me where I'm wrong in saying that we have now acquired the ability to climb out of the maze, to climb out of nature, and to look around and see what the hell's going on. What's driving us? What's motivating us? What's controlling us? And how are we functioning? Are we consuming the resources efficiently? Are we consuming each other efficiently? Uh, are we maximizing the conscious experience? Are we doing all these things you would need to do to be efficient? And even if we maximize the game, if the game is as I describe, 
just a contrived whapping of the spokes in a wheel. That you're only you're only putting fake um, prizes in front of something and creating a contrived need inside of them to acquire the fake, to acquire the crap. And and it, so it's chasing nothing. It's chasing a part you pulled off of something. It's like the headless horseman chasing a stupid fucking head. What's the fucking point? What are you going to do with it? Um, and that's where we're stuck. That's the dilemma of this whole thing. And that's the origin of our intelligence. It's just it only works as something to help us calculate some better game to play or a diff can reconfigure the maze but it doesn't have, it can't take us anywhere else there's nowhere else to go we're feeling things we're needful things and the point is, is try to maximize the need equation and the easiest way to maximize it is to not to invent it don't make a mess then you don't have to be really good at cleaning up messes I mean, it's pretty obvious. And if you're going to make them, then you have to be really good at cleaning them up if you're going to be satisfactorily functional. I mean, we have to be almost perfect janitors to justify the existence of the janitor. Alright, I think that's enough of that. But yeah, I gave, the fact that I can't comprehend what the fuck you're talking about isn't my fault. Alright, either say something directly or fuck it. Because, yeah, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. The empty space between atoms, I don't see how it's relevant to um, human existence, human intelligence, or human purpose. Or the function, or our efficiency as um, things, existing feeling things. The efficiency of the feeling process itself. It's a natural process and it's not efficient. Sorry, but that's just the way it is. All right, so anyway, this is this guy, the other brother, or the other brother, or whatever the fuck it is. So, what I would ask you is, do you really believe that a, a social movement could be perpetuated that could possibly override the, the gross human desire not only to have sex, but the, the essentially inborn desire to propagate all right, well, it's right there. I think that's just a, a non-starter for me. I've made videos about this. I don't think there is any inborn desire to propagate, okay? Nature doesn't have to give us a desire to propagate, all right? It gives us a desire to have sex, to stick wieners into vaginas, and that's all it has to do. We don't have to understand the process, and no animal, I don't think there's an animal on Earth deliberately having kids, Deliberately saying, I'm now going to procreate. Okay, no. They're deliberately having sex for pleasure. They're not making babies on purpose. And I don't think humans did that <laughs> for most of their existence on planet Earth. Okay, they had babies just because it happened. They didn't know why or how. And now we do know why or how. And now we can separate sex from procreation. And now if you want to talk about people somehow having an innate need to have children, well, there could be some argument that women have a, an affection for caring for things. Um, but, you know, it's an affection for caring for things. Uh, there's plenty of um, psychology research on, you know, postnatal depression or whatever you call it and all this other stuff. So women don't necessarily have a great time doing that whole birthy thing. Um, and, you know, the newborn doesn't thrill them to pieces sometimes. So let's not even argue about what they need or what they're after. But the point is, is they, they do have a, a, a capacity, a resource of um, a desire to care, give. Um, there's probably no argument there. But it's like any other desire where, yeah, we can, you know, turn the knobs, we can fluctuate it and we can sublimate it we can find something else that's like it like we made fake sugar and it works for people most people can say okay if I can't eat regular sugar I can eat this fake sugar and it's good enough and we can find replacements for the real deal um, the natural deal so I don't think any of that is I think it's infinitely overcomable and if we, we quit subsidizing childbirth 
you're going to reduce the number of people having kids, and you know it. If people had to pay the real price for their reproductive choices, they're not going to like the bill that's going to come with that, with doing that right. And, of course, we would force them to do it right. Um, and I think also if there was some other, like I said, a prize of some other kind, like immortality or living 200, 100 years longer, you could live twice as long. Um, because we had certain technology and you just made a deal that said, well, you can't have the technology if you have kids. Um, I'm sure people would, would find a way to mitigate that desire. Uh, and it would be like some other thing to get over, like a certain, you know, you have some sort of, um, maybe you like to eat whale meat as a kid and then you can't have any later because you're all out of whales. Well, you'd learn to find something else to eat, wouldn't you? So, I think it's just a bullshit argument, and I think it just, I think it's bullshit on the sense that I don't think it's a, an accurate definition of the physical circumstance. We are, we have evolved to do, to have sex. We haven't evolved to procreate deliberately, or willfully, or through desire, especially males. I don't think they have any ingrained, inbuilt desire. I think it's all cultural. We have... We've associated children with status and uh, virility and all this other crap. So there's a lot of cultural pressure, maybe. And maybe there's even some ego pressure, but that's also cultural. Like, I want a little me kind of bullshit. Um, but again, that's not a good thing, is it? That's not, like, called a rational reason to do something. So why defend irrationality? I mean, the future should be pretty good at spotting irrationality and saying, now let's not do something pretty important irrationally. Alright, so then we get to the second argument. I think I wrote down what time it is. So around 6.40 maybe. See how that works out. Negates the need to bring it to an intermediary end. Right? If it's going to end when it's going to end, then it should either be have to be now or when it happens of its own sputtering, pathetic, natural course. You see, because the compression of time it is not in and of itself. All right, well, this, this argument, I mean, he's not very, uh, he didn't do a very good job of making the argument, so I'll try to paraphrase it better. Um, because what he's saying is just ludicrous in a way. He's almost saying, okay, as soon as something's in the past, it's irrelevant. So the pain of the past is somehow irrelevant because it's not being experienced and it's not in the future and it's not in the present, so it's in the past, so it's dead, it's irrelevant. No, we all know it's still relevant. Okay, the Holocaust, those, those lives were real lives. The pain and suffering was real. There was a real pay, price paid. I mean, real money was spent. So you can't really argue that it's irrelevant. It's part of the price paid for the overall existence of the human race, and it's decidedly negative. Um, and there's no, you can't just undo it just by saying it's over, so therefore it's undone. That way you could get over any war that ever takes place by just saying, well, it will be over and then irrelevant, so it doesn't matter. So you could say that about any murderer. Well, the victim's already dead, so why convict the guy of murder because the victim's already dead? I mean, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say it's meaningless. It's still meaningful. Um, and then the second part of your argument is also senseless. Because you're, you're, you're arguing as if, this is what I glean from it, um, that somehow it doesn't matter when it dies. Like, it doesn't matter how bad the disaster is in a way. It's almost what you're saying. Like, somehow there'd be no point... If a war was going to be a hundred years long, there'd be no point in cutting it down to fifty years long, because either way it's going to be over someday. I mean, it just seems common sense that if something is negative, you reduce as much of it as you can. And you don't, the two choices aren't one hundred years and zero years. There could be a whole range of choices. So yeah, I would go for the hundred percent solution if I had hundred percent power. I mean, if I could press a button right now and planet Earth just vanishes, yeah, I'll press it. Fine. No big deal. No skin off my hand. Um, you know, yeah, zap it. Fine. Because, yeah, I see it as basically fail. It was a failed experiment. The whole life thing is insane. So, yeah, stop it. 
Um, it's got nowhere to go. It's got nothing to do. So logically, I can say, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with that idea. Um, now, let's say if I just knew it was potentially negative, um, and it was going to end in one million years, well, I'd still say, okay, well, why not stop it as soon as possible? And so what if everybody else won't agree with me for a thousand years? So I want to be fair, and I'm going to fight with them all and have a democracy and argue about it. But the point is, is it's always going to be sensible to stop it sooner than later. I mean, and if you can't stop it tomorrow, well, the day after is better than waiting a thousand years. So there's no point in just saying it doesn't matter. And then you use the word nihilism in this video. It's like, well, what the hell? You why even bother using a word like that? I'm not a nihilist. I'm not sitting here saying there's nothing we can do. I'm not saying just live for yourself and think and care not. That's bullshit. I'm saying the whole thing is a worrisome, problematic circumstance and you need to actively fight it. You need to actively do something to correct for it. Um, I'm not futile about the fact, I'm futile about the fact that life has no purpose. But as individuals, there's a ton of janitorial work still to be done. My point is, there's no point in making janitors. There's no point in creating future janitors. But there's plenty of work for us to do. Fuck. So any janitor who ends up here still has to work as a janitor. Um, so nihilism, nihilists can go fuck off, okay? Those wastes of fucking space. Um, uh, yeah, fuck that selfish shit. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I answered your question. But yeah, it wasn't a great video, so... Um, I don't think the two points are relevant. I mean, the, the, the fact that even if it was impossible, even if there was some structural impossibility, I mean a real one, that said it can never, ever, ever happen. Um, what's the, how would that change the fact that it's the truth? How would it change the basic argument that it's um, a reckless imposition um, for a person to have children. Uh, how would it change the truth that nature is without compassion, without concern for dignity, without intelligence, with, with, without any mindful respect for the sentience it's, it's plaguing to horrific circumstance? I mean, how is that, how is that truth changed? To know that truth is changed. The, tr the, the truth of the argument that underlays the entire philosophy is not changed by the fact that whether it can or cannot be accomplished. It's still the fucking truth. I mean, fuck. I mean, you could be slaves, owned and, and, and just totally suppressed and incapable of ever escaping your slavery, and you could still point out, this is bullshit. You could still raise your hand and say those words. So, I mean, fuck that shit. So anyway, I think that's it. Close enough to it, I think. So anyway, yeah, I mean, thanks for the video, but, you know, yeah, I, I didn't really think the questions were all that good. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so anyway, yeah, people. There's Jay Guy, he's cool. Math Fails made a human video. Still trying to work it out. Life and shit. But it looks good, so it seems to be surviving, and it's, you know, sometimes you just got to be in survival mode. It's the only way you can get through the day and such. And, you know, the week, and then the month, and then the year, and then the decade. Yeah, unfortunately, you can spend a whole decade in survival mode sometimes. It's kind of a bummer. So anyway, enough of a video, I believe.